Hello everyone, welcome back. Patrick here. I hope you're having a great weekend. So a lot of people have been asking me to give an update on LCA, Golden Nugget Online. So here it is for the people. I have an update. So today we'll be talking about the lawsuit that they're facing right now, uh, the merger date potentially. And then after that, I'm going to compare the revenues that they announced versus what they had projected in the presentation. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the chart and my price target for the merger and after the merger. So let's get started right now, but of course, please like and subscribe, it really helps out. See you in a second. All right, friends, let's kick things off by talking about this supposed investigation into LCA. A lot of people have been concerned about it, and I mean, I understand. Like, when you see that there's an attorney's office that's investigating your company, you think, well, what's wrong? But remember, disclosure, I'm not your securities attorney, right? This is an entertainment channel. This is just my opinion, so don't hold it against me, right? This is not legal advice. But basically, there's these companies that are chasing after all these SPACs and they send out a press release right? and then they ask for people to contact them. So for LCA, let's see what they say. Basically, they, they want you to like encourage investors with losses to contact the firm and then they give the guys information and they want you to call them. So I'm sure there's some suckers that are going to actually call them. But so there's the Shaw Law Firm. Then there's the, this is for uh, Diamond Peaks, so Lordstown. You got the Weiss Law, this is a very common one. Then you've got uh, Brodsky and Smith. Here's Goris Mitropoulos, GMHI, which is a new SPAC that I'm following. Weiss Law again. So they do that with literally every SPAC. So again, remember, this isn't my legal advice, right, or anything, this is just my interpretation. But I personally don't really pay attention to those because my theory is that they use it as marketing because they manage to get into, like through PR Newswire, they just send out this press release and it gets distributed to all the news outlets and that gives them a lot of free publicity. So. Do with this what you will, right? I mean, personally, I, I read it just to make sure that there's no, nothing like serious about it, but 99.999% of the time, it's nothing like serious. They, they say, if you might have a claim, contact them and they'll try to investigate it. They're, they're looking for people. They're not investigating something specific. So do that as you will with it. I mean, for me, it's not a big deal, but I figured I'd bring it to your attention because a lot of people have been asking me about it. Now, moving on to the merger date, that's another question that's on everyone's mind. And sadly, I wish I could give you a good answer, but there's just no way to know for sure. The only thing we can do is try to gather some clues and kind of make our own timeline. So what do we know? We know that uh, they filed their preliminary proxy statement on uh, August 12th, so about three weeks ago. And usually they should know from the SEC about a month later if it's being accepted and then they can file the definitive agreement. So in this uh, statement, there's no date. It's just the text. They need to get the approval of the SEC and then they can move on in the process. So this is one of the issues is that right now with all the COVID and during the summer, the SEC is backed up. Plus there's more SPACs than there used to be. So if we look at Hylion, remember they had filed their uh, initial pro uh, preliminary proxy statement on July 10th. And just a few weeks ago on the 13th, so a full month later, they filed a revised version, right? So they're not even into the definitive agreement. They're only in the revised version. Now, the one good thing for us is that since this is kind of a related party transaction, we all know the whole deal with Fertitta being on both sides of the transaction. Um, if you guys see, this company was created, the SPAC was created in 2019. So unlike some of the other SPACs, we're almost guaranteed not to need to get an extension. Because if we look at BurgerFi OPS, uh, recently they had to make a new filing to ask the shareholders to vote on an extension to give the company, like the SPAC, more time to complete the merger. And that causes more delays as usual. So we don't have that with LCA. So Right now, I can only give you a range, right? My expectations, and this is assuming that their preliminary proxy statement is accepted with no revision. In that case, 
I were looking at the end of September and early October. So kind of the same date range as uh, Tortoise Hylion, but we won't know until we get the definitive agreement, which should be fairly soon, a week or two. So let's talk about some fundamentals, shall we? First, let's look at the licensing. So as we know, they're licensed in New Jersey and their plans is to expand to uh, Pennsylvania and Michigan. And we really need that because if we are stuck in New Jersey, it's not that attractive for us. Their uh, potential is very limited. So as far as I know in Pennsylvania, they haven't gotten their license yet. I wish we had more news, but we don't. Right now they're qualified as a, a gaming entity. They're not based out of Pennsylvania, so so they had to be qualified in this special category to get one of the 13 licenses that are that are available. So in that state, each license costs $4 million. They didn't want to pay for all three. So they're only applying, as far as I know, for the casino license, $4 million. So if they get accepted for that, they'll be able to offer gaming in Pennsylvania. And right now, they still mention that they're uh, expecting it to start in January 2021. But for that, we'll have to expect to get some news uh, pretty soon, right? Hopefully we get some before the merger and that would be very good for us. It would confirm that our investment is going to progress. Now, Michigan does have some better news because they already have their agreement with the Kenina, Kiwina Bay Indian community. You have to have an agreement with a land-based casino to get a license. So they do have that. So that at least is progressing nicely. And then something that you guys will find interesting is in New Jersey when it launched, I mean, it was a flat curve for a long time. It took a long time for the casinos to start being profitable and getting a lot of revenues. Like you can see that orange line is fairly flat. In fact, in the beginning, it was downtrending. But this is the dark orange line is the current years, right? And we can see that it went from 40 million and now it's significantly ramping up, partly because of the pandemic, right? A lot of people are stuck inside, so they're not going to the physical casino and they're playing online. But here's where it gets interesting is we, now we have the trend from Pennsylvania. We can say that in Pennsylvania, look at how in the first few months, like the first three months, it started at about 5 million revenues, which I mean, that's not a lot, but look at how quickly it's ramping up right now. It's already past 40, 50 million. Uh, so this is very good for Golden Nugget Online, because we can assume that it's going to be the same in Pennsylvania and Michigan if Golden Nugget Online gets their licenses. So instead of seeing this very slow, like very slow growth, we can expect that they're going to get started right away and get some pretty big revenue boost from those licenses. So we'll have to keep monitoring that. That's one of the issues is everything that involves a lot of regulation is a pain in the butt, but we'll have to monitor it. We're still, that's why that's one of the big risks with this company. If everything goes through and they expand to other states, we'll do really, really well. If they're stuck in New Jersey or they can't get the other licenses or they're delayed significantly, well, that's going to hamper the stock. But when it comes to the revenues, this is where it gets really exciting. We've got some amazing news, and this is why we're into this stock, is the potential profitability, especially if they can expand. So on August 18th, they reported their second quarter revenues, and it blew my mind. 28.2 million in the second quarter compared to 15.3 in the same period in 2019. So an increase of 85%. Now that's a growth company. Imagine that. That's in one state. Imagine when they expand to the other ones. We can look forward to potentially over triple digit increases every year. That's going to be really, really exciting. But even more than that, Remember that 28.2 million, well, when we look at their investor presentation, they had projected 27 million. So even in their most optimistic projections, well, those numbers are lower than reality. Like in reality, they actually made more revenues than that. So this is why it's very, very bullish for me. But now the one downside is in the third quarter and fourth quarter, they had expected that their revenues would go down because hopefully the pandemic would subside and people would go back to the regular casino. Well, now we don't know if that's even going to happen. A lot of health experts think that it's going to stay the same or get worse in the next few months. So who knows? They might actually be above the 26 and 24. Right? So we'll know eventually when they announce the uh, the earnings, but it's really, really interesting for us. And same net revenue, 
24.8 million compared to 13.9 million, an increase of 78%. And then the operating income, 8.5 million compared to 4.9 million, so an increase of 74% year over year. So we can see that their margin is very good. Their revenues are growing quickly. Now, all we need, again, going back to the licensing, is for them to open more states. If we can get some of those licensing news before the merger, that would really help a lot with the valuation. But again, it's not something that we can control, sadly. All right, so this is the time you've all been waiting for. Let's look at some chart and come up with a price target for this company at the merger and after the merger. So when I look at the hourly chart, the first thing I notice is how strong it has been in the past two weeks. So remember, since the beginning, when the merger was announced, they had been trading in this channel between about $12 and $14.50. Right, and it hit the resistance a few times and it bounced back down. But finally, on August 20th, it actually crossed that resistance and it shot up to 1650. And I personally believe that hey, there it is, we're finally ramping up to the merger. Now they'll announce a shareholder meeting and we're good to go, it's going to go up. But no, now it's been pulling back a little bit. And if we look at the five minute interval chart, you can see that it's still above the support, like the new one at about 14. 1450, but it actually is trickling back down a little bit. And on Thursday, there was a very sharp sell off in the market. Literally every stock in SPACs and even the SPY went down on that day. So it actually went below that support, but it quickly shot back up. So that's very good for us, right? It, co it recovered fairly quickly. And of course, that would have been a very good entry point. So now we have to wait, like, uh, same as all of the other SPACs, when there's no news and we're waiting for a catalyst, it's going to trickle down because there's not that much buying. But the only thing that we can do is wait for them to announce a shareholder meeting, and hopefully that's going to be soon. Now, if we're looking at some prices where we could actually buy more shares, I bought more shares this week around here, right, when it was pulling back. So I added more shares, so now I'm at 500 if I was to buy more, I'd be waiting until it gets closer to the uh, new support. If it reaches between 15, uh, uh, sorry, between 14.50 and 15, I feel like that would be a great spot. Of course, under the support would be an amazing spot. Like, I don't think we're going to go back to the 12s or something like that. So this is where I would be looking to add more uh, shares. Now the warrants, I haven't been following the warrants for LCA. I'm sorry, I'm not going to comment on this one. But as far as the share price, this is what I'm looking at. Now, when we look for a price target, this is where it gets interesting. And that's where it's more art than science, right? There's no real data for me to compare with. So one thing I like to do is, I look at how does it compare in terms of hype and excitement with some of the other stocks. So if we look here, um, in the past month, Lancadia 2 went up 25%. If we look at other comparable SPACs, Graph in the past month has been up 28%. So, you know, those are fairly comparable in terms of people buying into it and bidding up the stock price. Now, Lordstown, though, I know it has political backing, so it's a little bit different, but 72%, right? So much, much higher. And then you have Hylion in a class of its own up 96% in, in the past month. So this is apples and oranges. You can see that a stock like Hylion has a lot more hype and excitement around it, and people are willing to pay almost any price for it. So we haven't had that for LCA yet. That doesn't mean that I don't expect that people are going to to like aggressively bid it up, but for now we can't expect it to double or triple like uh, highly on. So for me, if I have to use conservative numbers, I think that $25 at the merger is a pretty good target. Maybe if we get a DK, DKNG drafting scenario, maybe it can go up to 30, but I wouldn't expect it to last, right? A lot of people are going to take profits. So for me, a price target at the merger would be around 25 to 30. I think it's reasonable, right? It's a gambling stock. It's going to get a lot of attention. Heck, even huts went up a few dollars before the merger because of the momentum chasers. So I feel like 25, 30 is realistic, but after 
after that, I would expect that it's going to go back down because until they open up to more states, I mean, let's face it, the growth rate is going to be limited. So after the merger, I expect it to settle in the 20, 22 range, right? That's my expectations. So I hope that helps you guys. Again, this is just my crystal ball. Maybe in two, three months, we'll look back at it and we can have a good laugh. But that's kind of how I base it. I like to be more conservative. Some other YouTubers are much like better cheerleaders than me. But I, I'd rather be more conservative in my numbers and hit them than like ho uh, try to get a home run and then it doesn't happen. And then I'm upset I didn't hit my numbers. So I feel like those are realistic numbers and we'll see what happens. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you so much for watching.